You're listening to Dakota Spotlight, a production of Forum Communications. My name is James Wallner, and this is Season 6, Vanishing Act, the untold story of Kristen Deedy and Bob Anderson. This is Episode 5. Different this season, as you know, is the fact that I'm co-producing this with my colleague Jeremy Fugelberg. He's an editor for Forum News Service, which is the regional wire service for Forum Communications. I'm really happy that Jeremy agreed to join forces with me on this very important story. Now, we told you from the outset that this season is a live and ongoing investigation. Going into this story, Jeremy and I knew that we would need to prepare ourselves for the unexpected, new twists and turns, tips, maybe even some legal or bureaucratic hurdles. We also knew that this might put us in a situation where we are unable to get you an episode of reporting in a timely manner. Frankly, there's an incredible amount of work that goes into producing just 30 minutes or more of Dakota Spotlight. Jeremy and I realize that this week is the right time for an episode we are calling Intermission. This intermission is a short break from the reporting on Kristen and Bob's disappearance so that we can better address some very important aspects of everything, all in the name of finding answers and seeking justice. And so, instead, coming up in just a minute, we're bringing you something a little different this week. Jeremy has interviewed me by request from some listeners He's turned the microphone around on me to talk about Dakota Spotlight, true crime, storytelling, a bit about my life, and more. We'll be back with the next reporting episode about Bob and Kristen next time. But before Jeremy's interview with me, some updates on this season, last season, and some events coming up. Let's start with this season about Kristen and Bob. Thank you all for the questions and comments. This helps us to know what needs to be clarified better. As we've learned, Kristen Joy Deedy changed her name even before marrying Clyde. She was born Valerie Gable, but you might have heard me or others pronounced her original surname as Goble. This is likely a bit confusing. The name is spelled G-O-E-B-E-L, which, just reading, I would pronounce Goble. But apparently that's not how it's pronounced by most, including the family themselves. Gable is the most common pronunciation of Christian Joy Deedy's birth name. That's Valerie Gable. Another question we never answered in this podcast so far is, how long does it take to drive from Bloomington, Minnesota to Wishick, North Dakota anyway? Some may be wondering, is it an hour? Is it eight hours? Well, the drive is approximately six or seven hours. Here's another thing we've been asked about. Remember in episode one, the reporter who flew into Wishick Airstrip in 1995, two years after Kristen and Bob vanished? Nothing more than a strip. Well, there was a building, but a very small little building where you signed in on a log when you took off or when you landed. Nobody working it actively. There was no like air control, air traffic or anything like that. Remember he went to a farm outside of Wishick to ask questions only to be followed by people in a pickup later? It was hostile. It was, you get off our property. We have nothing to say to you. Get off my property or I can make you get off my property. Yes, we will be returning to this reporter's story and he'll tell us more, including what farm that was. And of course, we'll also be telling you about evidence in this case. You'll hear more from Chase Anderson, Bob's son, and others. Now, I also have one quick update about Season 5, A Better Search for Barbara Cotton. You can expect a new episode of A Better Search for Barbara coming in the next few weeks with some new information. It's incredibly interesting and will possibly be a bit controversial, but that's okay. I think what's a little controversy when our end goal is to find out what happened to a 15-year-old girl? I look forward to bringing you that episode as soon as I've conducted a very important interview. Another update is this. As some of you may know, last year we won a regional Emmy Award for our film The House on Sweet and Seventh back in Season 3. You local listeners who would like to see this film, mark your calendars. On Thursday, April 7th, 2022, the film will be shown at the Arts Center in Jamestown, North Dakota, followed by a Q&A session with myself and Derek Fletcher, who shot and edited the film. The event is open to the public and free of charge and a little bird whispered in my ear that at least one of the retired homicide detectives interviewed in the film will be there too. We really don't have a lot of murders in this area. And then to have a double homicide like this carried out by these two guys and their group of followers, 
It's just, I think it opened people's eyes as to there is another side to what goes on after we we shut our front door and stuff like that. There is a seamier side, underbelly, to Bismarck, North Dakota, and Mandan, North Dakota, you know. And, and I think that kind of brought it all out into the forefront. And I think Bismarck lost some of its innocence at that particular point in time. Again, that's April 7th at the Arts Center in Jamestown, North Dakota at 7 p.m. There's more information at their website, jamestownarts.com forward slash events. I'll see you there. And there may be more opportunities to see this film in Bismarck and Hebron, North Dakota, later in the year. And here is another date and event to note. I'll be at CrimeCon 2022 in Las Vegas on April 29th and 30th. If you're going to be there, I'd love to meet you for a coffee or something. Hit me up on Twitter at Dakota Spotlight or see the contact info at the end of this episode or in the show notes and send me an email. That's CrimeCon in Vegas, April 29th and 30th. So those are the updates I had for you. Now I'm going to get back to investigating what happened to Bob and Kristen and hand things off to Jeremy and his interview with me. Oh, and by the way, at the end of the interview, we talk about music briefly. And I mentioned that I would be putting together a playlist. That playlist is now on YouTube on the Dakota Spotlight channel. And finally, speaking of music, you'll probably recognize music in this episode. Once again, we need to thank Peter Hicks and Sleepy Driver for allowing me to use their great tunes, as can be heard throughout Season 2, Zealand. Check out and support Sleepy Driver at sleepydriver.bandcamp.com. Thanks again, Peter Hicks and Sleepy Driver, our friends up north in Canada. Okay, here's Jeremy. Hi everyone, it's me, Jeremy Fugelberg. I've got a treat for you today, especially you longtime listeners of Dakota Spotlight and fans of James Walner, who created and hosts the show. This week, I'm turning the microphone around and interviewing James. That's right, this time, James is the one answering the tough questions. Okay, maybe not all that tough. I ask him about his background, how he ended up in small town North Dakota, how he got into true crime and podcasting, why he created Dakota Spotlight, and how he copes with the difficult topics he's reported on over the years. Also, some questions from you, his loyal listeners. Yes, Emily, I'll ask about his favorite songs. Okay, my interview with James Walder. Let's go. Where Where are you? Where Where do you live? Where uh, Where do you make the podcast? I live in uh, western North Dakota, about an hour west of the capital of Bismarck, in a small town uh, named Hebron, North Dakota. And that's where I live. There's about seven, eight hundred people in Hebron. And I make podcasts out of my home office and home studio, which is more of a closet with some sound barrier stuff in it than an actual studio. Now, you didn't, uh, you're not born and raised Hebron, though, right? Uh, what's, uh, where, where are you from originally? So I grew up in Northern California and uh, in the California wine country, Sonoma County, and went to college out there in California and graduated in 1990. Um, and then off to Europe, I went for a couple decades, lived in Sweden, um, where I still have two grown daughters to this day. I'm actually a citizen of Sweden. I, I gained... Uh, no kidding. Yeah. After about 12 years there, I got uh, residence. Well, I had residence, but I got citizenship because that whole thing with dual nationality is constantly changing between different nations. Every every nation relationship seems to be different. And when I first got there, it was not possible to have both U.S. and Swedish citizenship. And then that changed mm. at some point. And I said, my daughters are here, so why not get citizenship if I'm able? Um, who knows? Maybe I'll retire there someday. You know, just never know what happens. So, um, yeah. Then I moved back to the U.S. in 2012. So did, does that mean you have to? You can have both at the same time, then, right? So you have basically two passports. Yeah, and that that's the, yeah. that's different for every country too. Some countries say no, you can't do that. And I was a little concerned recently that maybe that was going to change. That maybe the U.S. would say no, you can't be an American and be anything else or something like that. But 
And then I was going to have to make that decision. Well, do I give up my U.S. passport or my Swedish passport? And neither one sounded like a very fun option, but didn't come to that. At least not yet. Huh. Yeah. I didn't know that. This is fun. I'm learning new things. (laughs) Good, good. (laughs) Yeah, you don't know everything about me, Jeremy. (laughs) Far from. (laughs) Oh, I believe it. So, okay, so then how did you end up in North Dakota? When I moved back to the United States from Sweden, I had to pick a place, right? And I didn't pick North Dakota. I, uh, but I thought, where could I go that would, well, what would be a good fit for me? And uh, I had friends in Boulder, Colorado, so I had visited there a couple times. So I picked Boulder, Colorado, basically. And uh, I come from an IT background, um, web and database development. So I applied for a job in Boulder, Colorado. And I got the job, moved to Boulder after 21 years abroad, and basically started my first ever U.S. sort of corporate real job, right? Because I was a college student when I left, so it was more like summer jobs and wineries and photography Mm. stores and stuff, you know, when you're a young student. But I'd never worked in, you know, quote-unquote corporate America. So after 21 years, I moved back to the U.S., to Boulder, Colorado. And then the company I was working for was struggling, and I kind of preemptively got a new job before I would have been laid off, I think. And that probably would have happened, sounds like. Um, And I was just looking for something different. And because my parents grew up in eastern South Dakota, in small farming communities, and because all of my relatives are out there, I'd spent quite a bit of time as a child in South Dakota. So I kind of knew the well, I, I just, I don't know that I knew the lifestyle exactly, but I had an idea and I thought, oh, maybe I'll try this Midwestern thing. And then a, I saw a job open up right here in town in Hebron for a, uh, again, a web and database developer job. And I applied, mm-hmm. came up, you know, and I flew up and I was expecting Eastern South Dakota. I'd never been to North Dakota before, right? So I fly into Bismarck for the interview. The company put me up in a hotel there in Bismarck in a rental car, I think, yeah. And then I drove out west here towards the Badlands of North Dakota, and then and I kind of fell in love with it. It was like, wow, this is, no offense to eastern South Dakota, but this is rolling hills <laughs> and just beautiful buttes and, and kind of tundra I'd never seen before. And, and then the wide open space. I mean, I really enjoy the feeling of wide open spaces and be able to see all the way to the horizon as opposed to feeling boxed in. in a, I've lived in big cities, but... I just really love the open landscape out here. So that's how I ended up here Hmm. and worked at that job for a while. And um, yeah, that's how I got here. Wow. That's something that I feel like a lot of people don't do is kind of just go to a new, new place like that, just from kind of from scratch, right? It's not like you had existing friends there or family or, or whatever. Um, No, I can tell you a little anecdote about that or a story. Um, So, a dear friend of mine who's actually in, uh, was a girlfriend of mine. Well, actually, the woman who basically is responsible for me moving to Sweden in the first place. I met her in California, exchange student, Sophia. And we dated in the late 80s, and then I moved to Sweden, and our relationship didn't work out. But we are, to this day, just very, very dear friends. And hmm. she continually reminds me or points out that she's, she says, uh, James, it's like you just reinvent yourself all the time. Uh, maybe that's not verbatim, but you're, she's hmm. pointed out that you're, you know, she says, I'm not afraid to try new things, which, I mean, I like change, I guess is what I'm saying. I do like change. I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's exciting. So that's what I was going to ask is, you know, that sort of that reinvention, that change, was that how you always were as a kid too? Just sort of always kind of trying something new? Was that, is that kind of how, how you've always been? I think so, although I didn't probably have the the confidence as a kid. If I did that, it was secretly, you know, and on my own and, you know, maybe out in the garage taking apart a transistor radio. Hey, what's this thing all about? Or, you know, writing my own play or something, you know, but not telling anyone, <laughs> you know, like, oh, today yeah. I'll do this and today I'll do, tomorrow I'll do that, you know. And uh, so I think the creativity, well, the creativity was always there. Um but it was probably part of my uh, secret world, so to speak. What uh, what did you want to be as a as a kid? Did you have ideas of what you wanted to have as a job? Like all kids, I remember being really little and like different things. 
I wanted to be, we used to drive from California to uh, South Dakota, a couple of days of driving. And this was in the 70s mm-hmm. when, when there was this crazy CB radios and convoys and truckers were a big deal, like long haul. I wanted to be a truck driver when I was a kid. I wanted to be up there with my CB radio. And I mean, I think there was a movie and a song and everything in the mid seventies convoy. So it was very popular. Mm-hmm. And I thought it looked like you'd have your own whole world, own whole world there. You got a little bed in the back. I mean, what more do you need? You get to see the world, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's funny. I remember that. Remember that we got ourselves a convoy. E- yep. Yep. <laughs> So you're so you're in Western North Dakota working an IT job, and then what? I mean, how does how does <laughs> how does that turn into this? Right? Like, when when was the first idea for doing a podcast? Where did that where did that start? We look at just podcasting and and not the true crime aspect of it. I've always loved audio storytelling. Like, um, I've just always loved an old time radio i've always liked that to experience it you don't have to be looking at this square box in the corner of the room which basically Mm -hmm. hijacks almost everything else you're doing at the time because Mm -hmm. i mean you could maybe i don't know how to knit myself but i can imagine a person knitting or folding clothes even folding clothes sometimes is a little hard watching tv depending on what you're watching if you don't want to miss anything right so i've always enjoyed the audio part because it releases you from that burden of looking and opens up all, you know, it basically offers you the opportunity to use your imagination for all the visuals, which I think is really Mm. nice. And that's, uh, and I've always loved how sound, I've always loved music and I've always loved sound and been fascinated by the way music can change. I mean, if you think about it, it's crazy. How do sounds, airwaves change our emotions in this manner? I mean, I don't make, I can't make any sense out of it, but it's incredibly yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And the same thing, like what we're doing with the podcast now, like small sounds of a dog barking can mean so much mm-hmm. in a, in a podcast. So I'm not sure I, when I first came up with the idea for a podcast, but the first one I did was an experiment of, and it was, uh, it's still out there. If people want to hear, listen to my early work, which is, you know, it was basically my way of learning how to do a, a podcast. It's called Dakota Ball. And it's about small town high school basketball, where I basically followed uh, the local girls team one season about three years ago, three, four years ago. And I just thought, well, again, like my dear friend Sophia says, I just decided I'm going to learn how to do this. Was basketball really that big a deal back in the 40s and 50s? I decided that the first place for this podcast to start was to try to find out. long hard winter and high school basketball was the only thing in town the only game in town this is the 1953 beach team the buccaneers entrant in the state class b 1953 tourney being held at minor no and the goal in life was to play in the state tournament as much as i mean this wasn't dakota spotlight not the first podcast but topic wise the true crime topic this that wasn't a new interest of yours either, right? I remember in the 70s, I would have only been, you know, 15, 14. I think there was a congressional investigation for the second time into the murder of John F. Kennedy. And I think it started with the Kennedy thing. And then I read everything about Kennedy. And then I kind of uh, moved on to, I mean, I read um, In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, um, Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And Oh, and then I also grew up in Northern California, where I grew up, there was a heck of a lot of crime. I mean, there was a heck of a lot of murders, I should say. And looking back, Mm. I mean, we had the Zodiac Killer was in that area. In fact, one of the prime suspects at the time, I don't know, I'm not up to date on it, but in the book, uh, it was from Santa Rosa, the town I was born in. I mean, supposedly he lived there. And just down the road from where I grew up, out in Alexander Valley Road, outside of Hillsburg, California... Not far away, I guess, over closer to Calistoga and Napa Valley, was a place where they found several 
women's bodies in like 1972 and three that that, that case is called mm. the Santa Rosa or Sonoma County hitchhiker murder still unsolved to this day. I don't know how much that stuff influenced everything, but um, let's face it. I mean, a lot of people are intrigued by true crime, right? It's, I'm not sure exactly yeah. what it's all about, but the thought of putting together like a documentary style podcast was just really appealing once I thought of the idea, I guess. So you talked about the JFK situation. You did all the reading on that, but you know, there's a a lot of, like you said, a lot of people are interested in true crime. Um, Not everybody makes the jump to doing their own investigating, right? Um, Right. Like actually investigating. Like a lot of people read other people's investigations. So when, when was the first time with true crime stuff that you found yourself doing your own investigation? There's actually an aspect of the JFK investigation that I took on myself when I lived in Sweden. And I'll just, I'll really paraphrase that. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald, before the assassination, he, you know, he fled to the Soviet Union in like 1959. Just the weirdest thing. And there was one reference to him having, having been in Stockholm, Sweden, before he went into the Soviet Union. Uh, the, otherwise, the story was that he was in Helsinki got his visa into the USSR then there. When I saw that, there was one article, and I thought, I'm going to check this out so as much as I could. So I basically went to the National Archives in Sweden and asked for everything they had on JFK. And it was exciting. Like, I found out, sure enough, the SAPL, the Swedish secret police, had looked into it. They, too, had seen this article that maybe, you know, right after the murders, that this guy was in Stockholm, mm-hmm. maybe. So... That was like my first experience with, you know, going to an archive and exciting. I thought I was going to solve this, the Stockholm connection of Lee Harvey Oswald, but I don't think he was ever in Stockholm. It was just a a false report. You know, I've noticed on video calls, you know, what's right over your left shoulder on those calls? Oh, you're right. Yeah, it is the issue of the Aberdeen, South Dakota, American News from, I guess, November 23rd. Third, probably 1963, uh, the day after Kennedy was killed, in huge cap says Kennedy slain. And the cool thing about that, it's framed, is it's got my grandfather's name stamped up in the corner when he had it delivered to his home, of course. So Oscar Wallner. Oh. So that kind of adds an extra cool part about it. So Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you so you do your own research on that. You I mean that I feel like doing something like that, um, it's kind of like getting bit by a bug, I think, um, where you you don't forget that thrill. I think you know would the, it would would that be fair to say for you just ha- having that experience and then just knowing what that feels like? Yeah, when when I got the answer back from the Swedish national National Archives that we do have some things on Lee Harvey Oswald, and I've compiled it into a little folder here. You can come and view it. It was a thrill. And then later, I got into Kristen Didi. I guess would be the first or the second crime thing i got into and i know at the beginning of that you weren't thinking i'm gonna make this into a podcast (laughs) what uh walk me through just how you first heard about that case and and um why you pursued it started to pursue it yeah sure 2015 i was working here in hebron and i just found that on the um attorney general's website listed as a cold case and i thought you know let's figure i want to learn more I think we talked about this in episode one of season six here, you know, and I wanted to find out more and Mm -hmm. there wasn't anything else to find out or there was plenty I wanted to find out, but I couldn't do it because basically nothing's been written about it. And that started to, in hindsight, I think that started to bother me more and more that no one was speaking for these people or it felt like it, you know, the next thing I know I'm at the, in Bismarck, at the North Dakota State Archives, where you they have a microfilm of local newspapers. And I was looking through all the old issues to try to find more articles. And the only thing I really ended up finding was a reward that Bob Anderson's parents had put in the paper months later, I believe. And that started to bother me, I guess, more and more. And, huh. and I think that was sort of the fuel, like a feeling like, this isn't right somehow. So... A sense of injustice too, not just not just interest or like, oh, I'd love to solve a mystery. That there was there was more to it than that for you. That's something that comes sneaking up on me. Um, we talk about some of these past seasons, 
I don't necessarily know why I'm getting into it, but I know by the end, I feel I feel like I have a huge responsibility on my. I mean, you and I have talked about this about mm. this season. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. you're in it, and you can't. It feels like it would be such a terrible crime itself to do a bad story or to not do these victims justice, right? So it's mm-hmm. almost like. Mm-hmm you paint yourself into a corner <laughs> where like now I got myself into this. I can't fail or I can't let these people down or the families down. And you want to, it's, it's almost like I feel it's an honor, like in the, the Zick season two, the Zix, it's an honor mm-hmm. to be allowed to be the person to tell this story. The family has, you know, opened up and, and trusted me with that story. And it's like, you don't want to do a bad job, you know? So all mm-hmm. kinds of things, you know, it starts out with trying to answer a question, maybe a sense of injustice, like Kristen Deedee and Bob Anderson, where there's really no one else is telling this story. And then once you're in it, it's almost like it just builds on itself. And next thing you know, you're, well, as you know, sleeping four, ni- four hours a night. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but I enjoy it. I, I don't want that to sound like I'm complaining or anything. So 2015, you see this case, you're interested in it. You know, by by the end of that year, you're joining family members as they're talking to law enforcement about this. How did you build that relationship with the family? What, what was that first call like? Oh, well, I remember that first call. I mean, it was probably more like the 30th call or 20th call before someone picked up Bob Anderson's family. His brother-in-law answered the phone in uh, Minnesota, picks it up, and I said, Hi, <laughs> I'm wondering, you know. Are you related to Bob Anderson who's missing? It's like, yes. And then he said, oh, wow, this would, I remember he actually said, you know, it'd be, it's about time someone tells a story or a little, this is looked into a little more. And he suggested hmm. I call back that weekend to talk to Diane, his wife, Bob's sister. Did you, when you first talked to Mike, talked to the family, what did you tell them? Did you tell them you were doing something about this or you're going to be writing something or, or recording something? I mean, what did you tell them about what you were going to do with your involvement in this? I told them I was going to blog about it and start a website, I believe, which I did. Mm. Um, and I started blogging. And this was way before I thought I would be doing a podcast or, I mean, I just told them I'd be blogging. They were open to I mean, I, you know, I could see some people would maybe be like, hey, what are you doing what are yeah. you doing in our business? You know, why, why, uh, why should we talk to you about this really touchy subject? Um, was there that kind of hesitance or how, how did you address that? I think there was hesitance for sure. That's why they wanted to meet me in person in, in Minnesota there. Um, I'm pretty sure. And I don't blame them. But after that initial meeting, I think everyone seemed like they felt confident that um, we should move forward to at least create more awareness about this case, which is what I did with the website for sure. So you create this website, start doing this work. Where did the podcast idea come from for you? You know, to be honest, now that I'm thinking back, I'm not 100% on this, but I think I thought of I should start a podcast and tell the story of Kristen Didi and Bob Anderson. And this was before Hmm. I did the basketball one. But at the time, actually, we were trying to get a documentary film made about this. Oh, here comes the train. Here comes the train, everyone. So you get to hear the train from (laughs) Hebron, North Dakota. Um, I can't hear it. Well, uh, we'll see if you, it'll be here soon, but, oh, uh, there it is. <laughs> so I think that was it. And when I say we trying to get a documentary made, um, so here's what happened. Let me back up a little bit if I may. Yeah. Yeah. I considering the way the DD Anderson case is, I thought, what if I put up an, a reward and usually you'd put up a reward for information leading to an arrest and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, is there a way I can do this so that if this pans out, it would absolutely be worth the money for me to cough up myself? And would I possibly be able to raise money from other people to make this happen? So what I came up with was this. And I spoke to BCI before doing this. I actually asked them, do you see any problem with me doing this? And Uh they said, no, we don't see a problem with this. So the reward was $5,000, which I didn't have, but the reward was specified in this manner that for locating remains belonging to Kristen Didi and Bob Anderson. So hmm. that, that made me feel like 
if that happened, it would be worth it. Even if in the end I had to come up with $5,000 myself somehow, I'm, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I had people like my own father said, if that happens, uh, you know, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Are you kidding? Like that's, a, that would be huge, <laughs> right? Why not? Like, and would that be the end of the world? You know, I, not that I have $5,000, but you know, maybe that would be at the time that I, maybe that would be my legacy. I helped them find Kristen and Bob's uh, remains or something. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I put out a press release. Yes. Okay. I put out a press release about the reward, I believe, through the North Dakota Newspaper Association. And an, a journalist from the Bismarck Tribune actually called me, ended up being a front page article on the front page of the Bismarck Tribune. Then I felt really good, right? I've done all I can do, right? I've put up this reward. I've got a journalist to write about it. It's on the front page uh, of the Bismarck Tribune. Like, okay, job well done or whatever. You know, how much more can I do? So how did you go about choosing what you were going to do that first season on? I was sitting on a bar stool here in town. I started hearing rumors. I'd heard rumors about Victor Newberry, who was found dead outside of Glen Ullen, which is next town over, about 16 miles away. And he was found next to his running pickup on a cold morning deceased. And then I started hearing things, which you hear, I mean, it seems like anything, anytime anything happens, people want to make it into some kind of conspiracy or crime or something in small yeah. towns. And, you know, said, well, he was in a fight in the bar earlier that evening. I'm like, what? No way. You know, like, I'm so tired of these stories, you know? And then, and then someone else said something about mafia. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> the mafias in Glen Ullen, North Dakota, like, and it bothered me. Okay, it bothered me that people were just sitting in the bar talking about this and not even going to the length of calling the police to ask them what actually happened, mm. right? So mm-hmm. I thought, hey, I'm going to show, I mean, maybe someone said, well, you'll never find out. They won't tell you anything. I think that did happen now that I think back. And I was just kind of like, okay, I'll show you what you can do with a microphone and just by asking some questions. It kind of, it was like a challenge. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, let's find out what we can find out. And off I went in my own stubborn way or whatever. Like, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was an interesting quest, too. During the following days and weeks, I started to think about this man named Victor Newberry. I wondered if he had a family, loved ones. How would they feel if they knew that someone like Phil was walking around making these claims, telling stories and captivating audiences with his tales of Victor? I realized that there were two things that bugged me about it all. First of all, most likely Victor was not a victim of foul play, in which case it felt, I don't know, disrespectful somehow to be spreading this cheap rumor around. And secondly, if Victor really was killed, and if everyone knew about it, as Phil claimed, then in that case, it was even more absurd for people to be just talking about it on a bar stool and not doing anything about it. I admit that at the time, I didn't really know exactly what a person would do or could do. I only knew that it did not sound right or feel right to do nothing. But you've got some researching experience, um, and you certainly are interested in the topic, and you can be tenacious it sounds like that's been a value of yours <laughs> yeah for, for a long time <laughs> yeah um but still you just like everybody else you're looking at this podcast and staring at a blank screen for uh choosing the words that you're going to say um how did you decide how did you decide what to put there what did where did you start with writing these you, you're not someone who's written I haven't written any books. Podcast scripts, right? You haven't written books. You haven't written any of these things. So, you know, Mm -hmm. most people, I would say, would look at um, a blank page um, Mm -hmm. or something that even that they wanted to do, say, I want to write a book. And then they look at the page and then, you know, people maybe write three words and they're like, I can't. This is ridiculous. (laughs) Um, And yet you looked at that blank page and wrote a podcast about something that's difficult. How did you what did you how did you do that? Well, yeah, I guess we should add there that I studied creative writing in college, and I've had a couple poems published, so I've always been very interested in poetry. 
I've made my stab at writing music, even though I'm not a musician. Again, just trying out different things. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, I just sat down, like you said, with a blank page and started on season one writing. And I think I told myself, I'm going to write the kind of podcast I would like to listen to. And I just mm. went for it. And it wasn't for everyone that first season. Some people tell me that's their favorite season. And if I've had any sort of pushback on, you know, real criticism of the storytelling style, it would be mostly that first season when people felt like it rambled on too much, you know? But hmm. again, that was mm -hmm. season one, and I was like, well, I don't necessarily care how many people listen to it. If you don't like it, don't listen. <laughs> that, that was the way I thought at the time, right? So, like, yeah, so I, yeah. just, I just had the liberty. I wasn't employed by anyone to do this, so I had the liberty and the freedom to do it to write something that I would like to listen to. I think it's safe to say I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of true, cr true crime podcasts as well. Um, and you have a very unique style in, in terms of how you write and what you talk about and even how you talk in the podcast. Um, hmm. Was that something that was very intentional for you going in right away when you were making this podcast for the first time? No, not at all. Not intentional. Um, I don't have any conscious sort of formula. You know, you and I had a conversation before about my interviewing style with people, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you said I was able to put people at ease or something and open up a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, same thing with that. That's nothing that I have a formula or a strategy walking into, like, this is what you do to get people to open up. And that is probably the most gratifying part of this whole podcast thing is just kind of being able to be myself and people, I guess, appreciate it and like it. So it's not, well, definitely not something I'm really aware of even. No, I mean, I have to say just on the writing, the writing side first, I, you know, and I didn't mean earlier that you're not a writer. I meant you're not like a paid professional writer where it's your job um, or, right. or it wasn't at that point. Right. Um, right. Because I, I think you're a great writer. I, I've read I've read these scripts. I've read um, how you put this together, and it's it's good writing. You know, I think that's um, it's just interesting to try to understand kind of where you come by that, right? Um, mm. And and have the confidence to put those words there, um, and then put your name on it. Uh, that's something that a lot of people would be afraid of doing or shy away from, um, and it just wasn't an issue for you. Um, I've always had a very rich inner world like imagination and i spent a lot of time as a kid in that northern california when i was a kid just by myself we had for mm -hmm. a while we lived mm -hmm. out in the country and i would just sort of roam around i was very content to be in my own world and it had a lot of imagination and creativity i think in hindsight you know i didn't think of it at the time but i think sometimes when i'm writing i'm just i feel like i'm almost just re tapping into whatever that is whatever that is hmm that is something it's interesting that you talk about that rich inner world because you know i felt that where your writing really shines is when you are describing that right um describing sort of your own thought process or your own thinking or contemplation about you know what's happening in a moment right or what's happening in somebody else's head or what what's happening kind of in the room um that seems like that flows easily from your from your fingertips. Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, shout out to Daniel Schwartz out in California, who's, he was like one of the people who listened to my podcast before I ever released anything, kind of helped me, like, gave me some feedback, you know. So I did, I did have someone to bounce ideas off of, that's now that I think of it. But mm -hmm. he's always, that your best parts of your podcast is when you make it a little bit personal. I mean, that's what I've been told. Nine-year-olds are the true innocent bystanders in life. They have no say in anything, but are old enough to feel the consequences of everything. Wade Zick was nine years old when his grandfather, Eckelberg died. David Feist was nine when his father and uncle died together in an auto accident. Nancy Zick was nine when her adoptive mother, Leah, died of cancer. And Mike Wald was nine years old on July 11, 1976, when his grandparents were taken away. It was inside the bank in Zeeland that day that I understood why Mike Wald wanted to see the gravel pit and the other places in Zeeland. 
It wasn't just Mike Wald, the 52-year-old father of two grown daughters. It was a part of him, a part of all of us, a dormant nine-year-old yearning to understand. In his case, it was the grandson of Wade and Ellen Sick. It was a boy who, all those many years ago, felt the strongest urge to abandon the safety of childhood, to run across the street, to throw open the doors of Zion Lutheran Church and join all the others in saying goodbye to his grandparents, Wade and Ellen Sick. Tell me uh, how that transition happened from you being a, you know, working in IT and doing this kind of on the side for fun almost uh, to it being a full-time job. How did that, how did that happen for you? So seasons one and season two, I did while working full-time elsewhere and I had a hour commute each way to work. So basically I'd come home from work and I'd start working on my podcast till, you know, two in the morning. Sometimes I remember just going straight to bed, falling asleep in my clothes, getting up in the morning, going to work, coming home, um, just just decided, and you know, at the expense of, I guess you could say, I don't have any relationship. You know, I also cut out exercise, which turned out to not be a good. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but I just had to like pick, like, what can I, what has something's got to give for me to to get this podcast to succeed, and still have you know be able to pay my bills and and mm -hmm. two a couple years of that, a lot of hard work, and uh, my second season in forum dot com picked up or they helped you know they collaborated with me again or they even mm -hmm. bought a little sponsorship um, um i ran into matt von Pinon, who is the editor of inform i basically just emailed him and said i'd love to come and work for you guys full time to do this podcast maybe a year later i got a phone call um and that's where i am today um working mm. for forum communications doing this full time with you now and um, <laughs> still doing it as many or more hours. Now I'm just working more hours on it a week. So, but it's <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so you've done cases now, or you know, kind of written about people, um, and it's um, it's a lot of it's a lot of historical work, and it's a lot of interviewing people in person, and it's it's just such a combination of skills, which. Which of those things do you find the hardest? Well, it's the recording of my own narration. That is what I find the most huh. difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you just fumble over your words and you have to redo things three times. And yeah, that's the most nerve wracking part is, especially if it's, there's a deadline coming up, then, you know, you got to, got to do this. <laughs> so. Do you approach, now looking across six seasons of podcasting, do you approach telling the story sort of building that narrative the same way do you have the sort of the same approach every time you come into a season or do you how do you determine that i think it's evolving i do um and it's it's this struggle i have between i you know accepting that unfortunately people's attention spans have gotten shorter we've been told anyway there's so much content in the world and there's social media and we're always checking our phones and you know, every single movie you watch on Netflix starts in the middle with a, and then a flashback. And if you don't show people something exciting in the first two seconds, they'll go look at something else. I've, at least I've been told. So I struggle. Mm -hmm. So I think if anything, it's evolved a little more that I've had a little more awareness of try to get more action up front and let the backstory hopefully be told seam seamlessly along the way. Um, mm -hmm. too, like too much backstory up front, which which I did in episode or season one, uh, can be just too slow of a start for some people. But again, several people have told me that season one was their favorite. So, as someone now who's doing this for a full time job, how do you stay psychologically, emotionally healthy when you are dealing with some really dark topics and and talking to people with, um you know, really hard memories like that. How do you stay, how do you stay good or, or, or keep healthy? I have a pretty good support system. Uh, talk to my sisters on the phone a lot. Uh, they're both in California. And then exercise is key when I don't always do it. But for me, for me, that's a reset. That's, that, that is always a reset for me. If I can do that, I always feel better afterwards. Feels almost mm. like a rebirth in a way sometimes. And then just 
sort of acknowledging the feelings, right? As opposed to being mm. afraid of them. Like, if I just accept, like, of course this is scary, or of course this is just tragic and sad, it kind of makes it okay. Like in the season two with the Zix, I had a period there where I did get very sad for the Zix and their families, but it was kind of okay because why shouldn't I be sad about it? It's just an incredibly sad story. So mm -hmm, wouldn't it be mm -hmm. worse if it didn't affect me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like if you just, sometimes it's easier to embrace that kind of stuff. I mean, I, you don't want to hang on to it for too long, but get it out of your system kind of thing. You know, like people talk about crying a lot. Like sometimes it's better to cry and get it over with. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, that's like going to the gym who, I mean, People usually feel better after crying. Same thing with going to the gym. Either one of those work. This is probably a tough question, but if you were able to say something to your grandmother, Ellen, today, what would it be? Or, or what would you say to her? Mm, gosh. First of all, how, how much I miss her. I just had such a deep love for her. I would want her to know just how deeply she was loved. My dad especially was close to her and, um, and thank her for giving us the, the qualities that, that she had for the laughter and the joy that she brought. And then I wish she was here, you know. I wish she was here, but I know that her soul were connected you know, we're all connected, and um, I would also say that sickens me when I think about what she went through, um, when I think about the fear that she must have been in, because she was such a gentle person. She didn't deserve that, and neither did Wade. Um, it That's... I tell you what, the fear, when I, I think about the terror that they had to have been feeling, um, it's making me shake right now <laughs> um, because I, I would never wish that on, on them or anyone for that matter. But um, when, when you think of someone that you love so deeply um, going through that kind of terror, um, yeah, it just makes me very, very sad. You've built a really supportive, you have a lot of loyal listeners, but you have a really supportive community in the Dakota Spotlight Facebook group. Can you talk a little bit about how that's grown and, and what it means to you? Wow, yeah, it's incredible. It basically grew from uh, season five, uh, A Better Search for Barbara Cotton. You know, less than a year ago, I had... I want to say there's about seven, eight hundred people in that group, and we just hit four thousand this week. You know, social media can be a really mean place, right? And we've had very little, only a couple, like one troll maybe in all these months that only had hmm. to block one person for just being completely out of line. And you're right, incredibly supportive people in there. And I don't know, man, it means all it means everything. Like it's not what you would expect online. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm very amazed by the support uh, I get in that, in that Facebook group. They're just amazing, a bunch of amazing people, you know, and. And I've seen that echoed back from you too, right? Uh, it's not just them being supportive, but uh, you're very open with that. I mean, you talk about being introverted and, and, you know, kind of a way like this, but, uh, but, you know, you're willing to, to this group of people, you're willing to share personal details of your life and you know like like you posted what was it last night posted a like this is a song <laughs> that i really love right um yeah really kind of being vulnerable that way is something also that i think doesn't come easy or naturally um and i yeah. assume that that comes from the from what you felt from the relationships that you've got there yeah it feels like a such a cliche thing to say, but it kind of feels like family in a way, extended family. And, and it does feel good. Like if there's a song that's in my head, I did that during the Barb Cotton season. I mean, there was so much going on there for a few weeks and 
And uh, music's yeah. always been really close to my heart and a really big part of my life. So back then I shared something like, here, this is a song I'm listening to tonight. It just felt like a way of, yeah, sharing, you know, more with this little community. And um, But on the other hand, it's it's weird because I, even though I'm an introvert, I've also been told so many times in my life that I've heard this, I've heard this so many times, James, I've only known you for a week, but I feel like I've known you my whole life. It doesn't really add up, but I don't seem to have a problem sharing what other people consider to be personal things mm -hmm. to a total stranger, which for me is not the same as not, I mean, I still feel like I'm an introvert, go figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. It makes no sense. No, I see why you say that though. And I, I think, I think it does to me in that I think there's a lot of ways to build relationships and to build friendships and to build community. Um, and I think there's some traditional ways that people think about what that looks like. Um, and I'd argue that, you know, maybe traditionally, yeah, you're an introvert, but not really, um, not in the ways that really matter to other people and to you. So really all the ways that actually matter, you know, yeah, I'm not the person who walks into a cafe and I want to, I want everyone to look at me and I want to talk to everyone and chit chat. Mm -hmm. That's I'm not interested in chit chat and usually like that's I, I'd rather be involved in real discussions. You know, go right to it. But I think that's something, and I think it's kind of a superpower of yours, and I think it's helped by the fact that um, I've noticed this. I've really appreciated this myself. Is that you're very self aware um, and not you know, not in a self-conscious way. I don't mean that. I mean, um, you're aware of what's going on with you and inside yourself. And, um, that makes it a lot easier to communicate to other people, those things, um, which just inherently builds closeness, um, because people feel like they, they get to know you quickly that way, I think. True crime is packed with podcasts where people treat murder like it's fun or funny uh, or, or just comedic or entertaining or, or something um, just on its own. And um, but you're bringing in a different value set to what you do, um, it, and maybe just sort of in that way of thinking about it, what what are your values when you're telling a story like this? What's important to you? I think it's important that people who have been silenced or don't have a voice anymore get a voice and you know you're right murder is not funny it's not enter i mean apparently it is true crime is entertainment we can't you know deny that but in a way it feels like it shouldn't be i think you know all true crime mm. producers have an obligation or we should have an obligation to approach this in a sensitive manner and some are much, much better than others. And I feel like we're doing a good job with Dakota Spotlight now, and I've done a good job in the past. There's some things I would do differently. It's this fine line, really, because, you know, people... I interviewed a podcast producer from the UK earlier this summer, Dan Box, and he stated it this way, like, it, it's entertainment, and you sort of need that to get people to listen in order to carry the story. So it's to reach more people, especially mm -hmm. in an unsolved case, so that word spreads and you might actually get a new tip. It's like this entertainment is the vehicle to get the more important work done, which is finding answers uh, you know, you know, for unsolved cases anyway. And mm -hmm. so that line can be tough sometimes, but I, you know, I don't want to make a story all about a murderer. That's for sure. It's about the victims in the end and mm -hmm. hopefully finding a mm -hmm. voice for people who've been silenced, I guess. If you recall, one of our earliest conversations was me saying almost the exact same things about this is this is what's important to me coming in and helping on something like this. And these are the sort of the values I'm bringing to this. And I think, yeah, you know, I think one reason that we've worked together as well as we have has been that we share the same values there, right? Yeah. Um, for, you know, what's important and, and what not to do and kind of minimizing harm and trying to emphasize where, how to be helpful and work with family. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've made some choices in this season already that were, you know, there's some things we could have done, arranged something in a different way, or held mm -hmm. off some information for listeners, and it would have made it much more dramatic. And 
other podcasts would have done that very thing, but we said, nope, this is not ethical. This is not, that would be skewing things too much. So Mm -hmm. I'm proud of what we've done so far. I am too. I am too. But I'm also really, and I, and I mean, this as a compliment. Um, I think what, what you bring into or what you've brought into making this podcast over these seasons has been, I feel like anyway, just the right approach to writing, uh, you know, producing <laughs> something on a very serious topic that a lot of people take for granted as, or see as just pure entertainment. Um, oh, thank you. So I think your approach is, and that's the reason, that's the reason I think why you get the support and, you know, uh, assistance from family members, for example, right? Um, which in our world, that's everything. Um, to have that support and to know that they're on the same page and um, but that's not every you know a lot of other podcasts wouldn't wouldn't even care um, they don't care so anyway all that to say I, I just really that's why I'm just really honored to be a part of this I guess and really honored to count you as a colleague and friend well thank you so much I mean this is I appreciate you having here you here like I don't th- I wouldn't want to take this season on alone well that's uh, all the questions I've got for you i guess i didn't ask you about the music do you have do you have favorite what's your what's your favorite music do you have a top three or something of of great songs that you love or mean a lot to you i saw that question on facebook so i had to write down some only because like what do i do (laughs) if you ask me these but it's obviously impossible right like uh, i like so many different kinds of music but if i only get to pick three i might as well pick three that really like make me feel i'm at home or whatever when i'm listening to them and let's see, we'll pick. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, here's a song called Rinse Me Down by Bombay Bicycle Club. Wow. And uh, Like I Used To by Sharon Van Etten and Angel Olsen. And I get one more, right? Yeah. God, this is so hard, though. Like, it's a ridiculous <laughs> three song. Um, hymn, okay, Hymns to the Silence by Van Morrison. We'll go mm. with those. But we can put a, I'll put a playlist together and we can put a link in the show notes to like YouTube or something. I, I love that. You should definitely do that. Put your top 10, top 10. It can be certainly more than three. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much for talking with me and, and being vulnerable and open about your life and your work. And I'm going far away. Where the radio still plays our song And no better than today I'm following that falling star I'm gone. Dakota Spotlight is a production of Forum Communications. Season 6, Vanishing Act, is produced by me, James Wollner. And by me, Jeremy Fugelberg. Remember, the investigation into what happened to Kristen and Bob remains an open case. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. If you have any information about this case, contact law enforcement at the Logan County, North Dakota Sheriff's Office. The number is 701-754-2495. To read and research more about the case, check out the documents and photos we've uncovered at inforum.com forward slash Dakota Spotlight. If you have any tips or information you think could help us as we continue to report this podcast, please reach out. You can contact me, Jeremy Fugelberg, via email at jfugelberg at forumcom.com. That's J, my first initial, last name Fugelberg, F-U-G-L-E-B-E-R-G, at forumcom, that's F-O-R-U-M-C-O-M-M, dot com. I'm also on Twitter at jfug, that's J-A-Y-F-U-G. To contact me, James Walner, email me at jwalner at forumcom.com. That's J W O L N E R at forumcom.com. That's F O R U M C O M M dot com. Or follow me on Twitter at Dakota Spotlight. And why not join the Dakota Spotlight Facebook group? Just search Dakota Spotlight on Facebook. Please consider subscribing to the podcast on Spotify or Apple or anywhere you get your podcasts. If you like this show and want others to discover it, please consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. To support Dakota Spotlight, consider becoming a member of all Forum Communication news websites. 
To do so, head over to inforum.com forward slash subscribe. Dakota Spotlight is a forum communications company podcast. Down the north to